This is a, uh, one of the fun ones to go through with all the maps. I love you know making all the maps and, and getting through them because it's a lot of uh, it's a lot more um, insightful to kind of look and see and picture the distance and see the maps and see some of the things that we're going to see tonight. So I'm excited about doing this one. Uh, and uh, the conquest is one of the stories that's more familiar to us. So I'm going to be asking you guys questions and hoping you guys will be able to answer some of those uh, as we go through as well. So the first thing that we come into with this conquest of Canaan, uh, they've already conquered the west side of the Jordan. And the, the bulk of the Israelites are in this area that's referred to as Shittim. And so this, they, they may have spread further out, but they're taking up a large amount of this. And just to give you an idea, if you were a Canaanite and you were up on this side of the, the mountains, you'd be able to look over and see, in a sense, the entire Israelite horde there and be trembling in your boots because it's a lot of people probably about, you know, we don't know for sure because the, um, the census, I think, was taken earlier on before the, the 40 years in the wilderness. Um, I don't remember what, if they took another one uh, at this time. Uh, but it's probably about a million and a half to two million people that are all camped here. But some have already started to settle these hills and settle along the east side because the tribes that were given uh, um, area on the, on the east side of the Jordan, so the tribe of Reuben, Manasseh, and I think Gad are the ones. So they start to populate already the uh, um, east side of the Jordan. And when they're looking across where they have to go across, there is in this plain, and you can't quite tell from this picture, but right about in this line here, there's the, that's the foot of the hills that then start going up to uh, Jerusalem. But especially right here, it's a flat area, and that's where Jericho is. Uh, and there was a spring that was there, uh, and palms that would grow there and such. So it was always a little bit more fertile there around Jericho. And so uh, <clears throat> when they want to uh, figure out how they're going to take Jericho, they send some spies, and the spies seem to go up a, a little bit north to where there would have been uh, a way to cross the river. And then they come back down and they approach Jericho. Uh, when they get into Jericho, uh, the people of Jericho figured it out. They knew that some Israelites had come in and they're searching around uh, for the spies. And the spies, instead, uh, uh, the, the spies, instead of getting caught, they hide and they hide with who? Rahab. Rahab. Okay. And Rahab was a harlot. So. You know, how it is that they got connected with Rahab, you might wonder. Well, part of it is probably the fact that they would have been going and trying to find a place in an inn, and inns and harlotry went hand in hand at that time. They didn't have nice hotels like we did now. When you traveled, you tried to find family, and people usually invited you into their, their home. Uh, hospitality was a huge thing. An actual inn uh, um, was always a, a hotbed of nefarious stuff. That may be why uh, that it was they came across uh, Rahab the harlot. Now, when they come across Rahab and they're talking to her, she basically explains to them that the Canaanites have been stunned by the fact that the Israelites took out King Sihon and King Og on the east side of the Jordan. So when they heard that, it said, she said, I think that their courage just failed them because what were they going to do? They were hoping that those two kings, thinking they're powerful kings, would have been able to stop the Israelites. Now remember, the Israelites have been wandering for about 40 years. They're not a major military power. They haven't been attacking anybody. So they're thinking they're not that experienced and they're hoping that uh, things would go bad with them and at least the battles with King Sihon and King Og would deplete their forces, none of which happened. Uh, and so they had heard that. Also, you have her uh, uh, telling them that all the people in Canaan know about the events of the Exodus. So the crossing of the Red Sea, all of the plagues in Egypt, the people of Canaan are aware of those things having happened. And again, they would have happened only 40 years before. That would have been big news if Egypt went through all of those plagues and Israel escaped. Uh, the news of the army being destroyed in the Red Sea, all of that would have been very, uh, very well known. And so what you have here is... 
God actually using fear tactics on the Canaanites. So they don't have the courage to come out and fight because they have seen some of these amazing things that God has done. Uh, and this is where her actual words are that the, she has learned that Yahweh is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. So she has, she's got this sense of, of God's uh, omnipotence and the fact that he is the God, not just a God. This is important as to her rescue and her being included with Israel because they are being told to wipe out every single Canaanite. But what you have in a sense here is a conversion on Rahab's part. She actually had faith in Yahweh and, uh, and she ends up becoming a worshiper of Yahweh and she ends up being in the line of the Messiah uh, himself. So that's why she is rescued and her family for her behalf uh, is rescued. Now, when they are, are um, being sought out, when the spies are being sought out, you have the people coming to Rahab. She says, oh, they went out this way and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is one of those interesting things because in the book of Hebrews, Rahab is put in the hall of faith for this act of faith that she did. But what was the act that she did? She lied. So this is one of those, you know, things you get into discussion around coffee and seminary, like, so is lying okay? You know, how do you deal with this? You know, what do you go on? You know, can, and, and so on and so forth, which we can get into a discussion like that sometime. We're not doing it tonight. Um, and so, uh, of course, maybe I've lied and we'll do it later on. No, just kidding. Uh, but so, you, so you have uh, you have this this lie that she tells, but she's telling this to save them because she believes they're going to be uh, the ones that are uh, the victors. And then she asks to be rescued, and they say, "Well, when you uh, when we come to take the city, put a red scarlet rope or thread or whatever outside your window, uh, and you will be spared." What is interesting is, as we have dug archaeologically at um, Jericho, there is evidence of the wall falling. Oh, we might actually get some more, get more chairs. Uh, there's, there's evidence of the wall falling, um, but there's one section that did not fall. There's one little spot that we, from the archaeological evidence, did not go down. So it very strongly supports the biblical story uh, of this happening and the wall uh, not falling. So uh, <clears throat> when you the spies escape, they, uh, um, they escape back and they take a more circuitous route out and about uh, to feign that they're going up into the land and then they come back around after hiding a few days in the hills. Uh, they then come back around <clears throat> to report to Joshua uh, about what is happening uh, at Jericho. So having heard from the people in Jericho how scared the Canaanites are, this gives the people courage. Uh, and then God uh, basically says, you need to cross the River Jordan. Now, when they go to cross the River Jordan, what is going on with the River Jordan that makes their crossing pretty amazing? Anybody remember? It's that flood stage. And so they, you're looking at the River Jordan. It's going at flood stage. You're supposed to walk across. Who goes first? Priests carrying what? Hard. So you're walking into a river at flood stage carrying a great big, huge, heavy gold box. Took a little bit of courage, a little bit of faith stepping into it. Um, and this is, this is one of those, you know, passages that inform us that God sometimes it's 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 that faith that's stepping in and us showing we believe even though right in front of me is the physical evidence that says I'm I'm silly I'm still going to believe and then God uh, honors that now when uh, he did stop the Jordan uh, or when they when they so when they cross from the Jordan they're going to go across here to Gilgal uh, and it says in scripture that it is stopped at the town of Adam. Now Adam is basically 24 miles up from the Dead Sea. And it says the water just piled up there. And the people of that town and the people in the area saw it. They saw the water just stopped. Uh, that would blow your minds, most likely, if you saw that. Uh, and then it's just the rest of this drain. Well, if you go from Adam all the way down to the Dead Sea, that's 24 miles. 
And so this isn't them kind of going across in this little narrow thing during the day. The whole river just stops and dries up and you see them all just walk across. Uh, now, that and the reason, one of the big things when I say that is if you ever do go to Israel and you're like, where was the crossing? Like, was it here? Was it here? And it's like, it was here. You know, so you're likely, if you're looking at the Jordan River in that first 24 miles, you're likely looking at where the crossing was. So you can sit, you can take that in because sometimes people are like, I don't know if it was the actual place or not. Uh, it's a pretty wide uh, ribbon, so you'll, you'll hit it. Anywhere around Jericho, you're watching where they cross. Uh, they likely went a little bit further north because they went straight across to Gilgal, in a sense, skirting around Jericho and not heading straight at Jericho. And this area right here uh, is, the, is Gilgal. So they go across uh, into Gilgal, and they settle there. They leave some on the, on the eastern shore. Uh, so the people that have settled on the eastern side are remain there. However, the fighting men from the people on the eastern shore, they actually make up the, the, the front guard that goes across first behind the ark. So they, it, the very first people across the river is an army, not just the normal people walking with their stuff. So the army goes across. There is that, that protection in that sense. Uh, and they go across, and the Canaanites are watching all this. So that horde that they could see from the hills, they're looking down, and they're watching it just move across the Jordan at flood stage, no problem. And they probably were trembling in their boots. Uh, and so uh, when, you have, when you have here this crossing, uh, this is where, uh, as you see in the inset of the picture, where it says, Oh, my people, remember uh, what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. So when you read that, this is where knowing these stories, knowing the locations, you realize, oh, Micah's talking about the crossing of the Jordan. If you don't know the locations, you read that and go, heh, and you just keep reading because you don't know what he's talking about. Now, once they get across, they have an exchange of stones. So they take 12 stones from the land, and they put it in the middle of the river, and they take 12 stones from the river, and they put it up on land as a memorial to all of their children after that to help them remember. And so when you do this, I, I would love, I mean, obviously the Jordan River has gone all over the place since now. There's mud and everything else that's there. The stones on the side may have been taken by, by people here and there. It's been conquered so many times. But it would be neat to try to do like a, a sonogram, if you could, of the land and just find out if there are these 12 stones buried somewhere there. It would be, it'd be kind of a neat thing to find. Uh, new Indiana Jones movie for you there, whoever's into that. Um, but these stones there, these are, um, when, when we talk, for instance, in the hymn of here, here I lay my Ebenezer, that's what this is. Ebenezer is rock of remembrance in Hebrew. Uh, and uh, not that that has anything to do with Scrooge. It's just, the, you know, the, the, in that song and when you hear that expression, that's what that's referring to. Um, Jacob set up a rock where he saw the ladder. And that was an Ebenezer uh, as well. Now, once they get into uh, Gilgal, which, by the way, at the time it was not called Gilgal because it's called Gilgal because of what we're about to talk about. Uh, and that's, again, where it shows that they talk about crossing over to Gilgal, but it hasn't even been named Gilgal yet because it's being written after they've named it. Uh, and at this point, God says, you need to circumcise all of your males. So the entire time that they were in the wilderness wandering for 40 years, they have not been circumcising their males. We're not told exactly why, whether they forgot or whatever, but now they were responsible to, to circumcise uh, all of their males. Now, what happened to the city of Shechem when, when the whole city said, oh, we'll circumcise all of our males so that the prince can marry Dinah? Anybody remember? After three days, they were really hurting. After three days, they were really hurting, and what happened to the city? Two sons of Jacob came in and took the entire city because they couldn't fight because they were in pain. Realize when you have the circumcision, 
that Israel has crossed its last military protection. There's no more river to defend it. There's no more uh, uh, geographical barrier between them and the Canaanite enemy. And they have no walled city, no way to have set up protection. They're not even on the high ground. They're down in the valley where everyone else can see. And God says, now I want you to circumcise all your males. And this is something that took an immense amount of faith on the entire nation's part. It's not just, oh, okay, they got circumcised. They had to believe that while they were in those days of healing and pain, that they would not get attacked and that God would take care of them. Uh, and so uh, when you see this happening, there is a certain sense of just, to me, in, in awe of the faith of that generation. Uh because this is a generation that went through the wilderness with uh, with all of the different things happening. They did not. They didn't actually. You know, some of them saw, but many of them did not even see the dividing of the Red Sea and such. Yet they step in with this level of faith uh, toward God. So, <clears throat> when you uh, see this happening, the circumcision, why is God having them be circumcised here at this time? Uh, and the, the name of the city being, or the name of the area being called Gilgal uh, is actually, this is like the uh, a hill where the, the shame of Egypt was rolled away. So uh, this is almost like being naming it Roll Away, is, is if you were to call it in English. Um, and there was, in a sense, the, the, you know, the remainder of the, all of the surgical processes, which is not something that we would actually think of as something to put on a flannel graph, uh, but that was all there that was like, this was this remembrance, this is where they rolled away the reproach of Egypt. Now, rolling away the reproach of Egypt, what do you guys think that meant? You guys remember as the Israelites are coming through the wilderness, what was it about Egypt that, that, that factored into uh, their hearts. That was a, an issue. They were thinking about the food they had left and everything. And the indoctrination probably of the Egyptians at the time of God and whatever else. Yeah. They preferred slavery with certain, you know, amenities to freedom in, in God and having God as their uh, their present deity with them all the time because they didn't have certain foods and immediate satisfaction of things. And so the reproach of Egypt is that idea. We, we prefer to have that, uh, uh, that immediate gratification of desire and go be fine with slavery than to, than to have what we have now in God being brought into this promised land. So when they get in there, that the circumcision is kind of like this. We are leaving Egypt behind. Uh, we are not wanting to go back to Egypt. And you don't ever hear them say, we want to go back to Egypt again. Uh, and so that's kind of the rolling away of the reproach of Egypt. Now, it's, it's just before this time that Moses is writing in Deuteronomy. And he actually refers to them uh, as, you know, actually being a rebellious people and that God will someday circumcise their hearts. And yet that's that's not happening yet at this time. And the circumcision of the heart that he's talking about actually comes at a later time when the new covenant arrives. Uh, and that's what you and I participate in. And so sometimes when we think of circumcision, we don't really think of circumcision as having anything to do with us today. But there is still a meaning in it that kind of points uh, to us. So when Moses talks in the Deuteronomy 10, 16, and 36 about the circumcision heart, Jeremiah refers to it uh, in Jeremiah 4, 4. Then you have the, the New Testament in Philippians 3, 3 and Colossians 2, 11, speaking of that circumcision of heart that we now uh, have in Christ. And so the circumcision was that shadow. Remember we talked about the shadow and the substance? So the circumcision was the shadow of what was uh, being portrayed, uh, whereas the uh, um, what we have in Christ is a substance. And this is where it becomes an issue in the New Testament. So, um, one, circumcision was the only commandment of the Abrahamic covenant 
that was to be passed down to his descendants. And when it was passed down to his descendants, it says this is an eternal sign of an eternal covenant. So when Christians then come into this thing called the kingdom and come in and be, they're coming under the Messiah, there's this huge question of why would they not be circumcised? And so circumcision becomes one of the greatest issues in the New Testament church of does somebody have to be circumcised to be a Christian or not? And there were many that thought, of course you did, because it's an eternal sign of an eternal covenant. Uh, it was necessary to celebrate the Passover and other Jewish feasts. And by the way, even if you were a Gentile servant or a slave in, in the home of, of, a, of a Jew, you had to be circumcised to be in that land. Uh, and you could not be a Gentile and be uncircumcised in, in Passover. So it was kind of hard for the Jews in the, that first century to just suddenly shut down that requirement and be fine with people not being uh, circumcised. <coughs> so circumcision was followed by was followed by other nations. You'll find that, and, and it's kind of an interesting thought because in Jeremiah 9, 25 and 26, speaking of Egypt uh, as a nation that is um, finds some favor with God because they also are a circumcised nation. Uh, so this was, you know, interestingly, this was, uh, there was one time that uh, I think it was Chuck Swindoll, who I, who I, I love listening to him preach, but he actually gave, you know, gave an interpretation of when Joseph uh, showed, pulled his brothers aside. Uh, I think we may have talked a little bit about this. He pulls his brother aside to show who he is, and he thought that he showed them uh, that he was cir circumcised, but that wouldn't have set him apart as an Egyptian because the Egyptians were also uh, circumcised as well. So what happens in the New Testament is the sign of circumcision is given before the law, which makes it easier to understand why some of those New Testament believers thought, well, this isn't part of the law. So if Christ fulfills the law, why is circumcision uh, gone? And uh, so while the Gentiles were able to become part of the people of God, circumcision seemed to be reserved for Jewish believers, according to Paul's teaching. And this gets complicated. Now, some Christian denominations believe that what happened was circumcision was replaced by baptism. And so if you are, if you have a church denomination that baptizes babies, their belief is not that that baptism exhibits that individual's faith. But just as an Israelite was circumcised on the eighth day and it showed that they're part of the chosen people of God, so baptism of a young child shows that they are part of the people of God through their family. And the question theologically comes is, can you pass down your belief through to your children because they're just born into your family? And so there are some that would say yes, you know, because of the, the passages that say, uh, um, of, you know, for instance, the Philippian jailer, he and his whole household, you know, believe they were baptized. So they, they talk about, you know, those things. And what I would say is, is there is, um, there is enough there that we shouldn't just look at people who do infant baptism and say, you're crazy. That's so unbiblical. Where do you ever get that? Because there is actually stuff within scripture. If you know the full theology that would warrant, you know, some of what they were, they were thinking of. Uh, you have, um, you know, for instance, the, the children, you know, if the, if the unbelieving spouse or the believing spouse stays with the unbelieving spouse and that way the children are clean and you're like, what do you mean by that? So, I mean, there's, there's none of it is solid. None of it is, is like, you know, this clinches it, but there's enough there that people that do believe in infant baptism are not unbiblical, whacked out and finding it in the middle out of nothing. Um, however, the, what seems to be the case within the New Testament, as you look at, uh, um, like Colossians, as it talks about it, uh, Colossians, a circumcision in the heart corresponding with the baptism that is of faith. And the other thing is that throughout Romans, our, we are children of Abraham by our faith. So a Gentile that is grafted in gets grafted in individually, and it does not seem to pass down to their children. And so it is only by faith that we get grafted in. And then it is our faith that makes us like Abraham and the reality of the circumcision of our heart, thus making circumcision for the Gentile a moot point. Paul seems to encourage, however, that Jews still continue to get circumcised. Can you guys think of the passages or the stories, at least, that... that Point to that. 
He had Barnabas. Yeah. Circumcised. He had he had Barnabas and uh, um, Timothy, I think, too, because he was half Jewish. Uh, so those in his in his group that were Jewish, he did encourage to be circumcised. It was the Gentiles that he did not encourage to be circumcised. And what seems to be there for Paul is, uh, and there's no solid statement of this or very clear statement, but what seems to be the case is that Paul is saying circumcision shows that God is faithful to his promise to Abraham in a physical reality. So that genetic descendants of Abraham who are circumcised are part of the people of God. But he wants to keep that distinction. If you were circumcised when you came to faith, stay circumcised. If you were uncircumcised, stay uncircumcised. Don't worry you know, about that uh, one way or the other. And so there's that continuation to keep the distinction of the Jewish nation for the sake of saying God was faithful to his promise to Abraham. Not to say that Jews and Gentiles should be worshiping in separate places, which is you know, one of the things today, unfortunately, that has happened more often. Um, so in this way, uh, circumcision today is an everlasting physical sign demonstrating that God's covenant with the physical descendants of Abraham is truly everlasting. So it still is an eternal sign. It is still, but it's to his physical descendants. Uh, we are not obligated uh, to that. Uh, the circumcision, however, here does point to that rolling away. And in some ways, there is a correspondence with the baptism in that sense, with the believer's baptism and the circumcision of the heart that we are turning away from the world. We're not longing for the instant pleasure of the moment like they longed for Egypt uh, at the cost of the kingdom that God has promised us. So in their time at Gilgal, <clears throat> they celebrate the first Passover in the promised land, which also was one of the main reasons why they had to be circumcised. Uh, it is likely uh, or possible that throughout the, the time in the wilderness, they did not celebrate some of those holidays. Don't know for sure, but with them being uncircumcised and it being a direct command that they had to be circumcised in order to partake of, of those things, it may be an indication that those things weren't celebrated as faithfully as we may think. So the first Passover... The food for all of the feasts came from the produce of the land, which tells you they're already, in some sense, having some minor conquests in the area of Gilgal. Uh, and as we're going to see when they go up to Mount uh, um, Ebal and Gerizim, they seem to have pretty free travel without any fears because the families and everybody go with it. So there probably was some, some at least coming into control of the area. It may not have had battles, but they would have moved into that area and people fled before them kind of thing. Um, while, uh, while they have the Passover and they eat of the produce of the land, that's the last day that manna was, was there. So manna did not show up anymore. Uh, the interesting thing here is that through all of that time, so 40 years before, 40 years plus before that manna started every day, without regard to how good Israel was being. And that's something for us to grasp. It did, Israel did not have to perform well enough to get the manna. And so that, that promise of God to take care of those things, give us this day our daily bread, that, that request of him, and we can know that as we're asking those things, it is his desire to give us that provision. And all throughout that time, he continued to provide what was necessary it wasn't always what they wanted, but it was what was necessary uh, to take care of them. Then you have Joshua encountering the angel of the Lord. So he goes to look at Jericho, spy it out and see, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to take this city? And uh, so when uh, he goes there, he's looking out over the city and this angel appears to him. One of the things is that's important to grasp here is he received, the angel receives worship from Joshua, indicating this is not your average angel. Your typical angel, when somebody bows down to worship them, they're like, get up, I'm a servant like you, don't do that. So the fact that the angel of the Lord at this point receives the worship of Joshua tells you this is probably a pre-incarnate uh, Christ. And then also the command to take off his sandals goes back to Moses at Sinai when he is speaking with the Lord. So there's two different indications that he's speaking to a pre-incarnate Christ. Then you have Joshua saying, as he sees this 
fearsome angel. And he says, are you on our side or are you on their side? And the angel's answer is no or neither. And uh, this is, is, a, is an important thing. There's one, God is not on one side or another. The question always is, are we on God's side? That's the biggest question. But I also wanted to, to tell you that this has been a really impactful thing for me when just talking with people, whether you're, I, I, if even I'm doing like marital counseling, if I'm sitting down with my two daughters who are arguing with each other, uh, if I have two people in the church that are having a hard time getting along, it's so easy for us to kind of get on the side because we might identify more with one or the other. You go in with one big prayer. God is not on one of these two sides. And you want to be as much like he is walking into that situation so that you have find as much of the balance between the two and you're aware of where each one is at. And so this, this passage always goes through my mind as soon as I walk into a situation where I'm dealing with conflict uh, and talking with two people. And I'm like, Lord, put me in that neither side but just loving them and wanting the best to come out of it. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of times he's, he's done that and he's helped with a lot of, of wisdom in, in those prayers and answering that. So now we have the battle of Jericho. The people of Israel are, are here at Gilgal in this little section that they've crossed over into. And the very first place they're going to attack is Jericho. It's a stronghold that if they were to go deeper into the land, it would be at the rear. It's just, so strategically, you don't want to leave that there. But Jericho is one of the oldest cities. In fact, right now, it's from what we know, it's the oldest city on, on the planet. Uh, and it's been well established by this time, and it has decent sized walls. It's not a huge city, so the walled section of it is not very large. It's uh, eight acres. So how, how big is our property here? I think someone here knows about 15 acres. So you're, you're talking just over half of the property here is Jericho. So when they're walking and going around and walking around Jericho, you know, each day, it's not like it was a huge long walk uh, kind of thing in that sense. Um, there would have been, there would have been houses and stuff out along the wall and in the roads going to it and such. Um, but everybody would have fled into the walls of the city by this time because of Israel being present. And so they go, uh, and uh, the instruction that God gives to, to Joshua is you, what you're going to do is you're going to go to uh, Jericho and you're going to march around it and blow horns and then go back. Now I want you guys to stop for a second and think how much it would take to talk people into doing this. I, you got to feel ridiculous. This is what we're going to do. And they do it. And not only do they do it, everybody do, does it. You don't hear a bunch of complaining about it. Everybody goes. Everybody does it. So they go and they march around. They go for how many days? Seven days. Seven days. First six days, they go out, march around it once, go back. And they were supposed to not make a noise. At all, while they're marching. Keep it as quiet as possible. Can you imagine being on the walls of Jericho, how creepy that would be? <laughs> like, you're standing there, and they're like, they're not doing anything. They're not saying anything. You know, they're not making a noise. Nothing. It's just, you know, and, and uh, it, it would have been very unsettling, I think, for the people inside there. You talk about kind of that fear tactic. Um, and then, basically, what happens is then on the seventh day, they march around seven times, and they blow the trumpets, and when they blow the trumpets, the walls just fall down. Archaeologically, as we look at the walls and what we see there, it shows evidence that the walls just fell down. And, uh, and like I said, and the section of it is still there. Uh, so when people sit there like, you know, oh, archaeology, haven't we shown? It's like, oh, that's all myth. It's like, no, we have clear evidence that that happened. Now, the way they try to work their way around it is the, the different archaeologists... Um, with different perspectives have said, well, we've dated these, you know, the different layers to a different time. So that's at the wrong time. So yeah, you have evidence of the walls falling down and a section standing up and everything fitting the story, but, but it's the, from the wrong time because we've dated it differently. 
And how they dated that way was by pottery. And how do they date the pottery? By the layer they find it in. How they date the layer? By the pottery they find it. I mean, it's, it's just, you get to where it's really, it's not an authoritative thing at all. So there is actually definitely archaeological evidence that this stuff uh, did happen uh, at Jericho. So they go up, they they take everything in, in Jericho, they, they devote it to destruction. Uh, God said, this is mine, the city is mine, you devote everything to destruction, everything is to be killed, uh, and that's what they were supposed to do. So when they're done with this, they now control this whole plain on this lower part of the Jordan Valley, and the next step was to go up and to tackle Ai and Bethel, mainly Ai. Now, when the spies went up again to go check out Ai, what did they come back with? What was their report? Easy. It's going to be an easy one. This is not going to take a lot of people. No big deal. We'll go up and we'll, we'll, we'll take it. What did they fail to do? Pray and ask, inquire of the Lord. Should we go up? I mean, they've got the Urim and Thummim. All they do is go up to the high priest. Hey, should we go up and take AI? And the high priest would have went, nope, something's wrong. But they didn't do that. They didn't inquire the Lord first. And this is something that also comes out as a lesson to us, that the battle belongs to the Lord always, not just when it looks hard. Even the easy stuff, we need the Lord to be, be there with us. And even the easy stuff, we need to be uh, dependent on him. Uh, and what what happens is they go up to attack AI. And when they get up to AI, there's a battle and they don't do so well. Uh, the people from Bethel come out and they help AI. And the guy, people are trapped and they all flee to return to Israel through the hills. And there's 30 some people uh, that are killed. And, uh, and as a result... What is Joshua's reaction? He's like, oh, no problem. We'll go back up. What, is it? what does he say? Anyone remember? Gene? He sought a reason for it and found uh, one of the animals had stolen. Before he found out the reason, he goes, he, he, he has a talk with God, falls on his face like, why did you bring us out of Egypt? You're like, wait, is Joshua saying this? <laughs> Like, you just brought us here to be annihilated. Now, this is Joshua, who has seen the Red Sea part. He has seen all of the different miracles. He has seen the, the, the stopping of the Jordan River. He's just watched Jericho's walls fall. Why is he panicking like this? We might just be like, oh, this is no big deal. But think of the actual context. Think of the situation he's in, both militarily and strategically, in the land, what's happening? What, what's kept them safe up to this point? The fear that they can't be defeated. So here's this little town of Ai, and it defeats them. He's afraid that news is going to spread, and all those armies are going to come flying out of their cities down on them, and they're going to be doomed. And so, you know, again, he, you know, you'd think, well, isn't the Lord there? But he knows they've made a mistake at this point. And he doesn't know if God, you know, God was saying, hey, look out, Moses, I'm going to wipe you. you know, he doesn't know where all these things are. But that's where God's like, get up off your face. Don't you know there's something wrong? If I gone in the battle with you, you wouldn't have lost. Something is wrong. You need to take care of it. And that's when they, they, they begin to then go through and seek out to find uh, uh, what happened. Why did they fail? So why did they fail? Just say it out loud. Aiken. Aiken. Aiken, Aiken breaking heart. Yeah, the <laughs> Aiken is, was this gentleman who, who decided to take some of the silver and fine robes and things from Jericho and to hide them in his tent. And these things were dedicated to, to the destruction uh, by God. And they were in that way, they were holy unto God and they were his. So in his essence, he's stealing from God. Uh, those things that that were there those elements would have either been destroyed or they would have been used in the temple that's like the silver and such would have been probably used uh, in the tabernacle I should say uh, and been dedicated uh, to the Lord 
Now, when they go through, they start off with all the houses of Israel, and they start to go, is it this house, is it this house, is it this house? So what do you think is happening here? I want you guys know what we've read. What's happening is they're trying to figure out where's the problem. What, do you, what did you picture in your mind was the process they were using to, to figure out whether this house was okay or not okay? Bing. What was Israel given for decision making? Urim and Thummim. So again, they don't always say they're using the Urim and Thummim, but you get these situations where it's like, was it this house? So the house comes before them? Nope, not that house. Next house comes before them? Nope, not that house. So I want you guys to realize, even though we're not told a bunch of times in Scripture about this Urim and Thummim being used, it is used. Uh, and they did go through the processes that way. And so uh, I, it's my belief that they used the Urim and the Thummim then to find Achan and to determine that it was his family. And when they got down to Achan alone, they realized that uh, he had stolen those things and uh, kept them in his tent. Now, one of the more difficult passages in Scripture is, what is the result of Achan's sin? He and his family are swallowed up and they die. Yeah, he and his family end up being put to death. Uh, stoned to death by the people of Israel for having done what they did. Now, this is a difficult passage sometimes because Achan confesses uh, and even apologizes. Why is he and his family still punished? And why his family? What do you guys think? Well, they knew. They knew what, what was there. We're not told, but they probably did. There's a good chance that they did. How many people died because of what he did? How many families were without fathers or sons because of what he did? 30-some people. And so there's that aspect that is there. Now, something that's just kind of something for us to think about here, because God is punishing and, and disciplining severely here because he's saying this is what's actually deserved in a situation like this. Other times when I don't do this, it's mercy. But you'll see here at the beginning of the nation's history, he's being very harsh so they know the truth of how, just how just and righteous he is. You take a life, a life's taken, a life for a life, that kind of thing. He's, he's, he, has that, he has that harshness. Now he's doing that and he's planning that and these people end up losing their lives, including the men, women, and the children. And we're like, like, that's horrible. But what happened to these men, women, and children if they were part of God's people? They would be, go eventually to be with him. Now, we typically think, you know, we, we don't stop and think about that, but like these families would have immediately gone. Now, at that time, the Old Testament, that's another thing to discuss. At the Old Testament time, uh, there would have been a, 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 uh, a place within Sheol. For instance, Samuel does not come down out of heaven when the witch of Endor summons him. He comes up from Sheol uh, when the witch summons him. And so there is a difference between the Old Testament saint and the New Testament saint that they didn't go immediately to be in the presence of the Lord. But these people, we will probably see Achan and his whole family in heaven. Because that wasn't the issue. The issue wasn't they were not saved and they were put to death because they weren't saved. It was they were put to death to fulfill part of God's plan to train Israel and to teach them and to discipline them. But at the same time, they then are, are, are with the Lord. And so... When, when we sometimes feel this in our modern sensibilities of like how wrong this is, we have to understand God's fulfilling this plan and these people that, that these kinds of things happen to, he still brings into his fold and they are still uh, part of his people. And in the end, they, they are the better for it because they got to be part of his chosen people. So now that you have the, the sin of Achan taken care of, and by the way, when they stoned Achan, it was a mournful thing. This wasn't like, Everybody was mad. It was extremely hard for everybody to do it. Uh, and that the valley gets named for that from there on out. Um, I think it means the valley of sorrow or something to that uh, effect. So now that you have uh, Ai and Bethel having won, now you have God saying, okay, you're going to go and you're going to attack, and this is what you're going to do. And what's interesting is this is one of the few battles where God is you know, saying, hey, this is, this is my plan, this is what I want you to do, where he's saying, I want you to use stratagem, I want you to use strategy. 
At AI, the second time, he doesn't use any miraculous anything to defeat them. So what does he do? Does anybody remember the story? He divides the army. What's that? He divides their army. He divides their army. So he tells he tells Joshua, send your army up, but take a section of it and put it between Bethel and Ai. And then put a second section laying behind the city of Ai. And then have your main force appear to go up the same way you'd went before and to attack again. And when they attack the second time, and the people come out from the city, flee like you did the first time. And it drew everybody out of the city. So the people from, from uh, um, Ai, they, are, they come out of the city to flee after these. The people from Bethel are stopped by the force that is put between Bethel and Ai. And then this other force, when they flee out of the city, goes into the city and burns it. And then the forces see that Ai is burning. They turn, they flee back, they're surrounded, they're crushed, and then they take Bethel as well. No miraculous stuff falling from heaven, no walls falling down, nothing. Why? Well, to prove that, that they, they are militarily um, a fear, to be feared. Well, there is that, but... What does this do with the first battle? It makes it look like they meant to do it. Because they, they went up, they fled, they only had, I mean, they had relatively light losses, really, with the 30. They flee, and the, the psychological warfare within the area, for them to go up right after that, feign the exact same thing, and then crush them, it makes it look like, oh, they fled the first time. To, to fake us out. And that's why they did that. And so it kind of eliminates. Now that's Dwayne's theory. Uh, I think it's a good one though. Uh, and uh, But it's just that, that you know, because, but I think what it goes to show is it goes to show that that, that kind of the, the psyche of being defeated, you know, already before you get there was huge. Uh, and what you'll find as well is throughout battles within scripture, it is the, the, almost the psychological battle. The number of times God defeats an army by turning them on each other in fear. You know, it's, it, and so it helps us understand a lot of, in a sense, spiritual warfare is not fought with angels that actually have swords. It's fought with the fears and the, and, and the panics and, and, and things like that. Both sides uh, uh, tend to fight that way. So uh, now what happens, Israel has made its incursion into uh, the middle of the land, and they take this time then to um, to have a covenant renewal uh, at Mount Ebal and Gerizim. So they go up to Shechem and they have this covenant renewal. I'm um, actually I'm going to escape out of this a second, and I'm going to bring up Google Earth. I showed this. Were you the one that I was showing the Google Earth with? Um, because you'll see why uh, Mount Ebal and Gerizim uh, were the place that they, they went to, to to do this. And, oh, come on. This is the other reason why you shouldn't switch to a, a Windows 11, because everything is no longer where it used to be. <laughs> So, um, no, stop. Now, are you guys seeing my arrow? Because I am not. There we are. Which way are we? There we go. All right. So, you can, this is, by the way, a, a fantastic way to get to know Israel and where things are. Um, and let me do this here a second. Sidebar. There we go. Okay, we got train on. Good. So right here is Mount Ebal and Gerizim.
I don't know if you guys can tell from this. I'll have to spin it. But do you see how there's these two amphitheaters here? You guys catch that? I'll spin it again. You guys can kind of see it. See how it's like two amphitheaters? So what Israel does is they line up with 12 tribes on this side, or sorry, six tribes on this side, six tribes on this side, uh, and then they, um, uh, in the middle, Joshua is standing there, and they read the law, and they read the law out loud. I mean, this was like, tastes great, must fill it. I mean, it would have been, you know, back and forth with, uh, with the law, and, and they, the, the six tribes would read, the one side would be reading the blessings, the other side would be reading the cursings. I mean, it's something else to... to to think of that going back and forth. Uh, and then when that law is done, there is actually an altar built on the top of Mount Ebal commemorating that with the law written on it. Uh, which, later on, we have the Samaritans who turn this into a worship site. This, by the way, is where the Samaritan temple is even today. Uh, the, the encounter with the Samaritan woman and Jesus was in the town right here, settled between us. This is Shechem. Uh, and so... Up here on the mountain was was the Samaritan temple. You're like, why would they think that was a holy site? There was actually a lot of stuff that happened there that would have said that was a special site uh, at that time, the commemoration of the law and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so they go there and they do this. And this is the families. This is the children. This is everybody. And so uh, going back then to um, the PowerPoint, you'll notice that they... Uh, So as they go up here to, to where Shechem is, you know, this area would have been probably relatively under the control or the fear of them was so great that they could march through and nobody was going to attack them. They had no, no fear of that. Uh, and so after um, Mount Ebal and Gerizim and they return, there's a likelihood you would say kind of this whole area here was under the control because not every battle is being given to us, but a lot of times there isn't a battle. When a giant army comes into an area, they just, you flee in front of it and you get out of the way most, a lot of times. Um, and so Israel probably had relative control of this whole area uh, by this point in the story. So then you have this little town of Gibeah and they're thinking, we're next. And so what do they do? What do the Gibeonites do? Do anyone remember? Okay, they make a peace treaty. But how are they able to make a peace treaty with Israel? Because Israel wasn't supposed to make peace with anybody. They were supposed to destroy everybody in their path. So how did they make a peace treaty with them? They sent a whole bunch of people in poverty and terrible shape. And yep. because they uh, looking for mercy, they made a covenant because they needed protection. Yeah. Asking Israel to do that. So they come in and they're, they're in rags and it's all torn and, you know, to me, it's like the very fact that they had to kind of, it seems like they had to sell it. Like, look how torn our clothes are. You know, look how bad our, you know, but, but they, the moldy bread, you know, they're like, oh, we've come from this long way away. Uh, and, of course, Israel does another one of its uh, uh, AI moves. And does it go to the Lord and say, should we make this treaty or not? No. They don't do that. They're just like, oh, Wow. We've made such an impact. People are coming from far away. We must be the stuff. Let's make a treat. I mean, I don't know what their motives were, but the, the, the thing is they don't inquire of the Lord. Again, a lesson here. It's just, it's just a treaty decision. Can't we just make a treaty decision? What's the big deal? But they don't inquire of the Lord. We need, this is, again, you have to be dependent on the Lord even in the small things. We get going, and it's like we... And, and we tend to only consult God when in a, in a panic. The rest of it, we think we can handle it, so we don't actually seek his counsel. The number of times we seek his counsel and you find out that his advice would be far different than what we'd be doing, even on the simple things that we think that we have, we have handled. And this is what this revelation is teaching us. He's, he's taking them through this whole history to let, them, to let us know these principles about this. So Gilgal, uh, so Gibeah, sorry, they pretend to be from really far away. They make a treaty with Israel. Israel makes the treaty, and when they do, they make a vow before Yahweh to protect them, that if somebody comes to attack them, they will go to help them, and if somebody attacks the Israelites, the Gibeonites will come to help them. 
Now, a couple of things with this. One, when we read in the the um, about the uh, uh, Amarna tablets, uh, having all these letters from all over the Levant of battles with the Habiru, and the fact that some of these battles are really far north where we don't read anywhere uh, necessarily in the book of Joshua that uh, that the Israelites <coughs> never went that far. So they're like, oh, well, it can't be the Habiru because there were no battles up in that area. Okay. Well, you can see that it was not that unlikely that a nation would come from a distant land saying, will you make a treaty with us? Saying that if we get into problems, you'll come up and fight with us which would explain why you have battles further north in the Levant area that the Israelites were part of that would have would establish why the Amarna letters were going that far north. Does that make sense? You guys know what I mean by the Levant area? The Levant area is the whole eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea. So it, up in modern-day Lebanon, modern-day Syria, like Aleppo and, and, and kind of further north like that, there are letters of the action of the Habiru. And people are like, well, the conquest didn't go that far. This shows that people could come from far away with the treaty with Israel. And Israel was allowed to make treaties with people that far north because they weren't Canaanite anymore. Uh, and that's probably why they were fine with the Gibeonites because they thought that they were too far north to be Canaanites. Second thing here is the Gibeonites making this, this uh, treaty with Israel really ticked off the rest of the Canaanites because the Gibeonites were supposed to be a really strong army and now they weren't going to be fighting for the Canaanites and Israel now has a treaty with them uh, and so the the kings of uh, of southern Canaan oh I forgot to do this this is them pretending to come from a long distance so uh, the kings from southern Canaan are worried because one of the biggest stops that they were hoping would deplete Israel before it got to them is gone. But what the kings of, of, of southern Canaan do is they're like, we're not going to attack the Israelites. We're going to attack the Gibeonites. Now this is another way of God making all things work to the good of those who love him. Because this is brilliant. Now, prior to the Gibeonites coming and making this treaty, all of these kings and their armies are locked up in their own cities, in walls that are going to take forever to go and take each city one by one. So now the Gibeonites, because they've come and made the treaty, they now uh, have this treaty with Israel that says, if someone comes and attacks us, you'll come and fight them. The Canaanites think Israelites will never honor that because we know they're supposed to destroy the Canaanites and their God wouldn't allow that. So they think Israel's going to turn on it and won't, <clears throat> won't come to protect the Canaanite or the Gibeonites. So they feel fine coming out of their cities to go attack Gibeah. But they were wrong. Israel, because they made a vow in the name of Yahweh, does fight and comes and protects Gibeah and catches all of their armies out in the open, which would not have been possible otherwise. So you see here the sovereignty of God taking the mistake that he allowed Israel to make to teach them a lesson, to make a point, to now take this, this city and turn it into bait to draw all the southern Canaanites. I, it's, I, I start getting geeked out eventually. It's just like, you're like, oh, this is so cool. Uh, and uh, and so, so what happens is when they attack the, the, the Gibeonites, the Israelites come, they fight against them. This is the battle where, where Joshua is like, let the sun stand still. Why does he want the sun to stand still? Because he's got the armies in the open. And if he can get them before the sun goes down, he can destroy the power that they have. And very few will get back in the cities. They won't be able to defend the cities. And so God has the sun stand still. Plus he helps with a few big hailstones. Uh, actually, the hailstones kill more than the men do. Uh, and so the hailstones fall and take everybody out. Joshua is taking everybody out. And, and they've got the solar. And in one battle, they take all of southern Canaan. It's amazing. Now, when I say they take all of southern Canaan, they have not killed every Canaanite in southern Canaan, and nor have they taken every city in southern Canaan. They have instead completely taken away its military power. So there are cities that still need to be settled, and we're going to find at the end of Joshua that as each one is assigned, each tribe is assigned their land, they were the ones to go 
do the siege, finish out, take out the cities and everything else like that. What Joshua is doing is breaking the back of the military power in that area so there are no large armies left to take on when the tribes uh, get into that area. Now, does anybody know what happens to the Gibeonites after all of this? God brings King Saul okay. against them and defeats them. Okay, so Saul eventually comes and defeats the Gibeonites hundreds of years later. Was God okay with it? Yeah. Well, no. He, no, no, he punished them again. Yeah. Well, what, what, ha what happens is, is actually a couple things. One, the Gibeonites become servants for the tabernacle. So all the wood that's gathered to keep that fire going all the time on the altar, that's the Gibeonites. For the next few hundred years, the Gibeonites become it. When David say, says in one of his psalms, "I would rather be a servant at the you know at the door of the temple uh, than a king, you know, in some palace," he's saying almost, "I would rather be a Gibeonite and be close to your presence in the tabernacle than to be some great king in a palace." Uh, and the Gibeonites serve that way for years. Paul, or sorry, Saul, that's later, New Testament, my bad. Uh, Saul ends up, uh, Saul ends up uh, um, going after the Gibeonites, thinking it will be pleasing to God because they're Canaanites. But they had made a treaty with them in the name of Yahweh. Yahweh had actually accepted the treaty and made the Gibeonites the servants in, in the, to the temple. And so when Saul goes after them, now understand, when Saul is going after them, the tabernacle is not functioning at that time. So I don't know how the how the Gibeonites would have been there. We'll get to that when we get to um, the period with with Samuel uh, in a couple of weeks. But the but the Saul goes after the Gibeonites, which is displeasing to God, and a famine comes upon the land during David's time, and they inquire of the Lord, why is this famine coming upon the land? And it's because of what Saul did to the Gibeonites. And so the Gibeonites are actually given some of the sons of Saul to put to death as a blood guilt uh, for having gone against the Gibeonites just because Saul thought, well, God didn't like the Canaanites, didn't like the Gibeonites, I'll just put them to death. But did he ask Samuel? Did he inquire of the Lord and others? And again, it shows you one of those things of like when you just go and, well, I think this would be good because I remember this instead of inquiring of the Lord and asking. Uh, and so you can see that theme pretty rich through scripture so what happens now uh, at this point is all of the northern kings realize they're next and they're in trouble uh, because they've seen what's happened on the east side they've seen what happened in the stronghold of Jericho they saw all these other kings being defeated which they were hoping would be there uh, to to accomplish more against Israel and again Israel at this point is losing no numbers whereas all the other guys are losing everything. So all of these kings decide to gather for a council at Miram Waters and figure out what to do. And so as they go and they gather there uh, to have this meeting, Hazor is the uh, largest of the cities. Uh, and to give you an idea, Jericho was uh, eight acres. Hazor was 200 acres, walled city. Uh, so Hazor is probably the largest city in all of uh, Israel uh, at this time. So the king of Hazor uh, kind of hosts this. All the other kings come up. What are we going to do? Well, Joshua's like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go attack them. Well, God actually lets him know, hey, they're doing this. You go and attack them. And he takes them on a forced march overnight and they fight against them at Mir Battle of Miram Waters and basically defeat all the armies of the king's in the north, much like they did in the south. So in very few battles, they have completely taken the power of the entire region uh, and given it mighty defeats. Now, at this point, as I said, there are still soldiers. They're back in the cities, but they are far deficient to, to defend the cities long term. Uh, and so you see that God has, in a sense, crippled the land, and it's now the job of all of the uh, tribes to then go and finalize the conquering uh, of the land. So um, with this, uh, again, this is where some people um, 
they get confused as you get to the book of Judges and you should, we're going to start in the book of Judges and it's going to say, hey, this group didn't conquer their area. This group didn't conquer their area. This group, and you're like, didn't Joshua conquer at all? No. They, so they conquer this. At this point, they have the allotment of the land. The whole second half of Joshua, that's how I would say the whole second half. Anyway, but the second half of Joshua uh, is, uh, um, is just the allotting of the land. Is this goes to this tribe, this goes to this tribe, this goes to this tribe, this goes to this tribe. So the border runs from this city to this city to this place to this place, da da da, da and it'll be allotted to this tribe. So on, so on. And that just goes all the way down through so that a good deal of the rest of Joshua uh, is that. So really, most of the stories you're familiar with with Joshua happen in Joshua 1 through 10. And the rest of it you probably haven't studied much in depth because it's not as interesting. Unless you have Google Earth, I think it's really fun. But uh, uh, no, it's it's uh, um, you, most of your tribal maps. They'll show you that, but that was that's pretty much what's happening is that tribal allotment, and that's where you do find out at that point some of the numbers of um, the people that are there. Now, once this is done, the soldiers that are from the tribes on the east side get to go home. So then they're trying; they're kind of establishing this, and now it's just the soldiers with each of these uh, that have to establish it. Also, it's important to realize the conquest was not complete. When you start reading in the book of Judges, you know, like the, you know, the tribe of Dan was given a very difficult place. It's a choice land, but difficult to take. So they just go, eh, and they blow it off and go up north and take a different place, uh, which they get in a lot of trouble for. In fact, in the book of Revelation, the tribe's not even mentioned, uh, possibly because of that. We'll talk about that uh, in the weeks to come. So then... Uh, oh, one other thing here, uh, looking at the map, the area that you see here that's darker yellow is more of where Israel settles. This here is the Jezreel Valley, the lowlands here, uh, and then the flat tablelands up in the, in the Golan Heights area. Uh, Israel did not have strongholds there. Uh, they, they tended to occupy the hills because in the hills... Uh, they were able to be secure and and uh, and such. Down in the valleys, the Canaanites and the Philistines had chariots, and so it's kind of like they, they took the hills. That was easy. Down in the valleys, you'd have tanks. They're like, yep, we're not going to go to the valleys. Uh, they should have still because they could have conquered the the chariots, but in their human reasoning, they were too afraid to do that. So right now, what you're seeing is Israel kind of settling this uh, more dark yellow area than the outer section uh, that is there. So, some of the theological themes that we have here. So you have, this is God's covenant people with the circumcision at Gilgal and the renewal of the covenant at Shechem between Mount Ebal and Gerizim. In other words, what's not to be missed here is the fact that God is fulfilling this not because Israel deserves it, but because it's his covenant with them. He has made a covenant saying, this is what I will do. I will bless the children of Abraham. Uh, and it's dependent for them on their, their side of fulfilling that covenant. That covenant becomes deficient, requiring the new covenant that you and I are now under. Uh, but that's a big focus there is that this is God's covenant people that he is with. Another thing that comes up in this section is God's man. So the number of times that... God affirms Joshua as his choice for succeeding Mo, uh, Moses is often. he. There's different times where uh, you see clearly like him him being able to have, ask the sun to stand still, the the, the, the Jordan and, and things like that happening. So you, you see the people following after Joshua and trusting him because God affirms him uh, with that. Uh, you also see that the people affirm Joshua's leadership better than they did prior to the discipline of the 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, because the people in Joshua's time, is like he did this in all Israel with him. You don't see the people coming after Joshua the way they came after Moses, which almost seems strange. Because Moses, I think of all that happened with Moses, and you have people rising up, so on and so forth. And I say that because the time in the wilderness worked. And what you'll see, like the time in the wilderness worked, the time of the captivity in Babylon worked, God knew how to work in the nation to bring about what he wanted. And he got this faithful generation through that discipline that occurred uh, in the wilderness. And then both affirmations are conditional upon Joshua's obedience to God. Uh, and so 
you know, Joshua, when he didn't seek God's insight for AI, you saw the insecurity that he had immediately. You know, how could this happen? How could this happen? How could we be defeated? But that was God going, you know, you wouldn't be on your face saying this to me if you understood what's going on here, Joshua. So it was a very strong teaching. He's like, he's like, you weren't defeated because I didn't show, or you weren't defeated because they beat me. They weren't, def you were defeated because I didn't go with you. That's why. And you always have to make sure I'm with you. And that's where you get to the other theme of God's battle. When the captain of the army of the Lord comes and he's like, whose side are you on? And he says, neither. It's important for us to, to really sit and chew on that. You know, even as a church, it's not that God's just automatically on the side of a church because it's a church. You know, there are times that churches go after things legally, but they're in the wrong and they lose. But they thought that God would be on their side because they're a church. No, <laughs> it's not the case. Um, you, you, know, you see the battle belonging to God with, uh, with the wall of Jericho and then the failure at Ai for them to defeat so firmly this stronghold of Jericho and then fail at Ai when God wasn't with them. You see that it has nothing to do with the ability of the, the uh, Israelites because even when they looked and said, oh, this is easy, it wasn't, and they did that. The mistake with Gibeonites, the sun standing still, uh, and then in the defeat of one, in one of the battles, one thing I didn't mention yet is that they do what David does later, which is they hamstring the horses and they burn the chariots. Now, why would you hamstring the horses and burn the chariots? Because you just said that the people down in the valleys had all the chariots and it made them scared. So why would you get rid of them? Like this army in an army. You yeah. Take, take away their weaponry. Yeah. You're taking away their weaponry, but why not keep their weaponry and use it against them? They would depend upon, you had said before, they would depend upon that instead of the Lord. Yeah, they would depend upon the chariots and the horses and not on, on the Lord. Uh, and the very fact that they didn't depend on the Lord and were scared by the horses and the chariots says a lot. Now, what does that mean for us? Now, ima imagine you're part of the army and you see them hamstringing the horses and burning the chariots when you're like, uh... We could have used those in the last battle. And so what it, what's being said there? How important is it to God that even when you, because they could have said, oh, look, God's delivered these chariots into our hands. Look, he's given us these things, right? So how, why is it important that they just got rid of them? And why does David do that? Be, yeah. And what I would say is this. God, it, it may not always... Oh, see so yeah, how it is. It may not be like they had to burn the chariots in order to be pleasing to God, but if you burn the chariots and you do that, you are pleasing to God. Does that make sense? So there are times today in our world, where, where you know, like with the church, where there may be ways that we could be depending on some certain things. We say, well, God's great that God's provided these, you know, these things uh, for us. But if we go, but no, we're going to set those aside. And not do that. Like one, I mean, one decision that was made early when I got here that I was really happy with the elders making is we decided not to take any of the COVID money from the government at all. Not because we thought it was wrong, not to condemn any other church for having done so, but we really wanted to see that God brought us through and that we, we would make it through and be in the black purely on what he did and not, not you know, like Abraham not wanting the king of Sodom to say, oh, we helped you do that. It's like, that the government gets no credit for where we're at financially. You might say, well, why did you do that? Why don't you just take it? Well, I don't know it's wrong to take it, but I know it's pleasing to God not to take it. Does that make sense? And so it's that in taking that step to be, you know, you know it's pleasing to God, then you know that God is coming in, and that's a way of expressing the battle does belong to the Lord because we're not taking in things we could depend on otherwise, uh, and, and we're going to let him... Uh, you know, take care of that. And that theology, by the way, is throughout the whole Old Testament. It's not just the, the conquest here of Jericho. Um, so the other thing you get here is God's recipe for success. Now, uh, when I first, my very first sermon I did in my preaching class in seminary um, was um, how to lead with strength and courage. And it was on Jer uh, Joshua 1, like 8 and 9, be strong and courageous and so on and so forth. And uh, my, I remember my preaching professor getting done. He's like, you should have titled it How to Be Guaranteed of Success. 
which I one I just didn't like that title because it sounds like you're doing like the health and wealth thing. But there was a truth to some extent to what he was saying. So it wasn't just how to lead with strength and surge because God says, you know, if you if you walk according to my law and do not turn to the left or the right, I will give you success wherever you go. And so uh, in that sense, it is God's recipe for success. What is it? You want to know God, which is you're going to meditate on his law day and night. You're going to obey God. You're not going to turn to the right or the left of it. You're going to trust him and step out in, in doing what you're doing because you're trusting him and be pleasing to him. And when you do that, you're not going to lose. And Israel shows that. And the very moment that Israel stepped out of this recipe, <laughs> they failed. And so as a church, it's important for us to learn from that and to grow from that and to realize how much we can't just go, well, you know, this is what we've done. This is, you know, our gut. The, that we have to be seeking God at each point. What would you have us to do? Uh, knowing him, knowing his word, obeying it, trusting him, uh, being pleasing to him. And then having that realization, if that's what we're doing, why would we be afraid to step forward into something? If we think it's God's will for us to do it, uh, and that's that that slight balance. I think there's there's that health and wealth gospel. It's like you know, uh, you know, just just God wants to make you wealthy. He wants to bless you. He wants to do these things. And the the thing that's so nefarious about that is God does want to bless us. And so to counter it, it almost sounds like He doesn't want to bless us. But the, the problem is, it says delight yourself in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. Not delight yourself in the world, ask God for a bunch of stuff, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And so this, this recipe is you're delighting the Lord, you're wanting to be pleasing to him, and then you end up uh, being able to step forward with that great courage of knowing he's in this, and we can be, be confident he'll, he'll accomplish it. The recipe for failure, neglect God, don't involve him in the decisions, disobey him. And again, the disobedience doesn't, you know, it's not just like a... Um, you know, the leadership is disobeying. This is the sort of the concept of the sin in the camp comes around. If there is disobedience and sin within the camp and it's not being dealt with, I mean, Achan was not Joshua. It's not like Joshua was the one who did it or some leader. In fact, he wasn't even a major leader even within his clan because they had to go through a whole bunch of people to get down to the point where they got to Achan. Uh, it's just sin, period. If the sin is there, uh, it can have that consequence. Uh, but then also you might have the other two, but then you don't move forward uh, with self-confidence, or you move forward with self-confidence instead of confidence in the Lord, uh, and then you take action for, for self-glory. That's going to be your recipe uh, for failure. Uh, you can also fail if you just don't even, if you don't have the confidence in the Lord and don't step forward either. So that's it for uh, this week. Any questions that you guys have about the conquest and this time period and what's going on? Yes. How many Israelites were like in the that The larger camp seemed to be about like 1.5 million. Um, so when they were in the hills and they saw it moving, it was. Oh, yeah, you'd have seen it. You'd have seen it. And then, but um, also understand that as they're moving through here, I mean, and this, is, this is where, trust me, we're not getting the full detail. Because every time you conquer something like this, you have to leave forces behind. You have to have occupying forces. We're not told about that. Um, there's a lot of other battles that are referenced just in part at the end of Joshua, beginning of Judges. You know, they fought all over the place and heading. You know, we're, we're told that, for instance, Caleb well, went and took a portion of Judah that was where the, uh, um, the Anak, the the, basically, the ones that, that Goliath is descended from, uh, but he the they, he went and took a whole bunch of them and, and defeated them. We're not told a lot about those battles, uh, so there's a lot that's not included in the account of Joshua, and that's where it's kind of like a gospel in that what was chosen is very specific to teach a particular point. Uh, many of the other battles, you know, as God went and gave them success after this, they were less. Um, they would probably have been less miraculous, like directly miraculous in the battles, because God did this first to crush the power and to bring their confidence and to scare the living daylights out of all the Canaanites that were left. Uh, and then the Israelites 
was supposed to conquer the rest. Instead, what happens is the Israelites just mingle with the rest. And we can be very condemning of that, but you got to stop and think how hard it is to go into a place and have to put out that many people and, and stuff like that. And so uh, we have to be really careful that we, we don't. I mean, we often read the Bible stories and we put ourselves in the, in the position of Joshua and the hero. And all you, yeah, we probably would have fit in with the other ones a little bit more. So. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, we ended early this week. All right, very good.